This is a Pele Media Podcast. Welcome back to Goonies Minute, everybody. Goonies Minute is the fan podcast where we carefully explore the movie Goonies minute by minute. I'm Brady. And this is Chris. And we are here to explore minute number 75 today. And we have some very, very special guests, Brad and Amy from Cosmic Geppetto Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. How are you guys doing today? Uh, Doing great. Doing great. Really excited to be here. Awesome. Me too. Now, Brad, you and I have actually recorded together a couple of times, um, but Amy, this is the first time that we're actually meeting. Now, listeners of the show and of... Ghostbusters Minutes have actually heard your lovely singing voice uh, because you guys actually recorded a song uh, specifically for those shows. So how did you guys meet? How did y'all get hooked up and start songwriting or recording or whatever it is that you do? Well, we met in college uh, really, really early into our freshman year. We were at a dance and it was a really terrible college dance. Oh, really? Oh, it was awful. It was one of those where it was like in the pu- public, the, the student union building, and it was basically like a big cafeteria that had yeah. like maybe two pieces of confetti stapled to a wall <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And Amy and I met, and we hit it off immediately because we both sort of seemed to revel in the ridiculousness of it. Mm-hmm. Then, not too long after that, we were both cast in a play where Amy, and this is ridiculous because Amy is beautiful, oh. and she was beautiful as an 18-year-old as well. Okay. Uh, she was cast as my mother-in-law. <laughs> wow, really? Hmm. Yep. Because when you do a student, when you do a college play, everyone's between yeah. 18 and 22 and look as good as they're ever going to look. Yeah, exactly. So your options are, you know, some somebody who's 18 is going to have to be playing like a mother-in-law in this case, so... You're going to have to make an, a hot chick look like she's 50. <laughs> so how did the play turn out? Oh, it was great. It was really good. It was, a uh, Barefoot in the Park, uh, which is a very good play, and it was a lot of fun, and we had a great time. And uh, Jarf, who um, is a, a, pre- a frequent contributor to the Cosmic Show podcast, uh, he also uh, w- had a small part in it. It was like all these people uh, were involved in this show, and a couple of whom have been lifelong friends. So it's, you know, and this has been, well, I'm not going to say how long ago <laughs> it is, because I don't, I don't think Amy needs me to. Fair enough, yeah, I'm fair a- enough. I'm ageless. And you guys, uh, when did you start songwriting together? That's new to the Cosmic Geppetto podcast. Amy's a very accomplished singing. Uh, a- a- Amy, why don't you, 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 you should uh, plug your own singing. I like to sing. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I haven't done anything, not much with it. I mean, I have, I do sing for a, a local band here in Cleveland called Midnight Drive. Awesome. What kind of music? It is classic rock. Um, they like to call it sophisticated classic rock. So oh, wait. that's <laughs> awesome. A whole new genre. When uh, when we when we decided we want to do a little original music for the Cosmic Chipetto podcast, because I, I you know I can play guitar okay, and I did a handful of songs. And it usually was just funny stuff to introduce guests or people who were recurring. And the problem is, I can sing okay, but I. I have a pretty limited range, and every song started to sound alike because it was just the same schmuck with the same, like, narrow ability. So I asked Amy, he's like, hey, I could use you to do a song for me. And she was so great, Aww. and she's uh, Aww. and so easy to deal with as well. It's not only that she brings the goods, but she's also, oh, yeah, I'll do it. And she gets it done in a weekend, and it's always gold. So Yeah. And when we did the song for Ghostbusters Minute, it sounded so good. It's like, oh, and the, and the poor, the poor Amy. Now she knows. Is like, I'm never gonna let her go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm okay. That's with awesome. That. That's a great story. My favorite part is the uh, pieces of confetti that were stapled to the wall. Because <laughs> Wh- which university was this? Yeah, Lock Haven. Lock Haven. Where is Lock Haven? It's about a half hour, 45 minutes outside the main campus of Penn State. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Right. Yeah. State College, Pennsylvania, right? There you go. Okay. Awesome. Well, we definitely appreciate uh, the songs that you guys have written for the shows, and they're, they're fantastic. Um, so I want to go into uh, the Cosmic Geppetto podcast. Tell me a little bit about that. The Cosmic Geppetto podcast, uh, it's a pop culture podcast we talk about, and sort of the tagline is we talk about movies, music, TV, comics. And whatever else we feel like, and it started. Uh, it actually started just me wanting to talk about the Marvel movies, but real quick, it uh, just 
uh, turned into just about everything else where I realized I went five or six movies, uh, five or six episodes without talking about Marvel movies. It's like, okay, I need to sort of broaden the spectrum. And uh, we've been incredibly lucky. We just had, um, you know, we've had Brady and Kyle. And by the way, it's, I'm really glad to, uh, you know, be on the show with uh, Brady. Uh, you know, I think we can all agree uh, Brady is the uh, Patrick Swayze to uh, Kyle's Don Swayze. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I like watching them two go back and forth. There you go. Away from the I, podcast. I am the Sylvester Stallone to his Frank Stallone. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> you know, the Alec to his Stephen Baldwin. I mean, it's where it comes from. That's right. And it's we've had, you know, great people. You know, I've been able to talk with people I've known for literally decades, like Jarf. And, uh, and then people, new friends like uh, Kyle and uh, Brady. And uh, also we've had some really neat people on the show. We had a... Sugar Kuiper, who was a contestant on Survivor and was also a, a recurring actress on um, Gilmore Girls. We just talked to uh, Dave Lagana, who was a writer for Friends and also wrote for uh, WWE. He now uh, is basically the videographer and uh, producer for Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins. That's so cool. So it's uh, we've had a chance, chance to, just a chance to talk with some great people, and I've been lucky. Amy's been on the show several times, and she's always so much fun. Aside from being a good singer, the, uh, she's also uh, a great guest. Oh, definitely. So uh, you know, here we are in Goonies Minute, and I'm sure you guys have been aware of this movie for a while, as we all have. Uh, I want to ask you all about your experience with the Goonies. When did you first see it, and what does it mean to you? Uh, Brad, let's go with you first. I saw this in theaters with my parents pretty young at the time. It was one of those where I think my parents were just getting comfortable taking me and my sister to movies together. And what really stuck with me is how much of a fun character uh, Chunk was and uh, Sloth. Those were just such great characters. The Truffle Shuffle. Yeah. That, that's pretty memorable. And him talking about uh, all the terrible stuff he did and when he said, oh, and this was the worst. And... My, my parents, I remember them just laughing for days about that particular <laughs> scene afterwards. Yeah. Um, Amy, what about you? Um, I saw it when I was little, um, probably on HBO or something when it was being rerun because we didn't go out to see a lot of movies. Um, all I can remember being kind of creeped out by it, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all it's... the, like, bones and weird people and, yeah. I think it creeped out a few people. There's no question yeah, about that's, it. That's I don't one, think that's uncommon. Yeah, consistency that we talk about on the show is how this movie reaches different levels of humor and just darkness. I mean, there's some, you know, a lot of moments in this movie that are just almost difficult to watch. I you mean, know? still to this day, there are things that gross me out, like the the whole, you know, when uh, Sloth goes to kiss Chunk. <laughs> I mean, to me, to this day, yeah. I, I can smell a, a can of sardines. Hey. You know, and think thinking about that, and uh, oh man, there, there's definitely some some scary moments, no question about it. <laughs> Even to this day, it 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 it'll shake you because it reminds me of you as it it reminds me you of yourself being back as a kid and feeling that feeling again of seeing it for the first time and it kind of yeah. bothering you. <laughs> it still works. I mean, that's this movie has staying power like few movies do. I actually also remembered the ending differently. Which really? I just re I just rewatched it recently, yeah. and I I saw the part where um, when they come across the explorer's remains. What's his name? Uh, Chester Copperfield. Yeah, him. Yes. Chester Copperfield. Yeah. <laughs> um, he finds a baseball card of Lou Gehrig, mm -hmm. and my memory was that when he came out of the cave and like well we don't have any treasure oh no but then one of the adults saw this baseball card and were like that's going to be enough to save all of us because that's amazing that's how i remembered it and i was so confused when that didn't happen that's so it's weird how our memories put things like that together but it's interesting that you say that because when we were doing our research for this minute chris i think you said that that's one of the most like, valuable what, baseball right cards. It, it, when i first it's it's like we watched this movie over but once you start breaking it down, really looking at it closely by the minute, it's amazing how much more that you see in a movie that you would never see as a child or even just watching it again uh, as, as with a group of friends is fun. You, you just don't see 
what you see when you break it down. And when I saw that card, I was thinking, wait a minute, you know, that could be a lot of money. Then I realized even the most expensive baseball card, it wouldn't save everything. But when I first saw the card and thought Lou Gehrig, hey, that's the most valuable card, I think, well, maybe that was a way out. Yeah, it's interesting that they would put that in there and put some so much emphasis on it. And then, you know, we, we figured that they're probably doing it to date the, the Chester Copperpot skeleton to show how long this guy might have been down there. Um, but that makes perfect sense. That's something that they would have possibly gone back to, you know? Yeah, I mean, so. it, it definitely made me think for a second, okay, how much would that be worth? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it, it's probably a thing that might have been just a little bit before you would see all the news stories about how, oh, this Babe Ruth card sells for Lloyds of London or whoever it is, sells it for three, three, three quarter million of dollars, yeah. stuff like that. Before, like, the Mark McGuire home run balls were worth millions of dollars and all. Well, one of the things that we're going to do towards the end of the minute broadcast, uh, uh, we're going to bring on uh, our jeweler friend. Yes. And we're going to look a little bit closer at those jewels to try to put a value and yeah. kind of get an idea of how much they actually had. So that should be pretty Definitely. interesting whenever He's we get He's a professional jeweler, so we're going to try and determine if this would have been enough. And we shall see. It'll be interesting. <laughs> It'll be interesting, <laughs> be it yes or no. But I tell you what, with that said, y'all want to get into the minute? At minute 75, Steph laughs at Andy for having kissed Mikey, thinking that it was Brand. Meanwhile, the Fratellis are making their way through the well. They spot the rope that the Goonies had used to get themselves down into the next cave. Jake says, I'll give you three guesses who did this. The three Fratellis lean down and shine their flashlights down towards the spikes. Bran notices the light. Andy approaches Bran, who tells her that the Fratellis have caught up with them. Andy jumps up and screams, they're here. Bran cups his hand over her mouth to quiet her, but it's too late. Jake has heard them. And thus ends Minute 75 of the Goonies. So here at minute 75, we see uh, some characters that we haven't seen in a while, and that is the Fratellis. Uh, you know, we've been following the Goonies for a while now, catching up with them, Sloth and Chunk, seeing, you know, the beginnings of their relationship and everything, but we haven't really seen the Fratellis. Uh, so we get to see them kind of creeping around the cave and figuring out, that, you know, that they're on the right uh, track in finding the Goonies. And, it, you know, eventually the rich stuff... Uh, because they know that that's where the Goonies are headed, so the stakes are really ramped up, and you know it's you know it's it's done so well because Moffatelli, as we've said, is just one of the most ruthless villains in film history, I think. And Ramsey is so good. Oh yeah, she can do this in her sleep. She she in the in the eighties she had this run where she was just playing all these mean old scary bats uh, with the what was it the Billy Crystal movie Throw Mama from the Train. Yep. She's got that grunt that she makes, too, that you'll see in the next few minutes when she's in the chase. She's, like, snorting. It's just disgusting. <laughs> but it's, like, perfect. It's a perfect noise to come from that, woman. from that woman. Yeah, there's just so many different colors there in the Fratelli family as there are in the Goonies. Uh, Francis is just sick. You know, I mean, that guy, I think he's even scarier than, uh, than Jake a little bit. But... And, and Jake is more of the absolute psychopath because he is one that can you can like him a little bit and he can like you a little bit but he can also fly off the handle at a moment's notice yeah jake will kill you even though he likes you <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly Definitely. but one, one thing i i wanted to to talk about is where this minute starts off and in the previous minute andy had just share that kiss with Mikey, of course, Andy think it's, thinks it's Brand, and Steph starts off the minute laughing at Andy, and Andy's like, why are you laughing? <laughs> it was beautiful. And, and and I love how, uh, one thing I wanted to bring up, because Steph says, next time, why don't you do it with the lights on? Now, and I, a lot of times you see this in movies when the other person makes a statement that one person would think, if somebody told me that, I would, like, shake them trying to get out of them why they said that. Why they said that, yeah. But in movies, you've never 
it, it's because it's part of the it's I guess that's how you have to play the story. You never get the answer to that. You never have the person ask, "Why did you ask me that?" Yeah. But man, in real life, I would have been like, "Why are you asking? <laughs> what, do you that? what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. No, tell me." Yeah, it, it didn't even register with Andy why that she even said it. She was just so googly eyed. It's like uh... Mes- mesmerized by yeah. the by the man Mikey. Um, that maybe she's just used to not knowing what Steph is talking about. <laughs> yeah. Now that's a good point. It's a possibility. Uh, Andy is, you know, a little flighty. Chris, your impression of Andy. I kind of want to make like, uh, I don't know, a version of this film, but get you to just dub all of Andy's lines yeah. and see how that would turn. Why are you laughing? Yeah, it was beautiful. I don't know. I might not want to do that. That's pretty terrifying. Know. Yeah. If you put my face to it, even be more terrifying. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, another thing that we saw was. Data, one of his inventions is the uh, Pinchers of Peril. And when he's falling down the tunnel, uh, you know, the Slinky comes out and the chattering, t- the wind-up teeth, you know, just save him right before he falls on the spikes. Well, we started to wonder, how did the Goonies, the rest of them, get down into that room that he's just discovered? Uh, yeah, did they climb down the, the Slinky or something? Now, Chris, I think you noticed something. Yeah, okay. And here's another one of those things that, I watched that movie, this movie, a bunch of times, and I never really noticed. So as we're going on by the minute, I noticed, so the Fratellis, of course, have joined this chase, and we see them in the room where all the spikes are, and you see a rope. So it's obvious. Now, where they got the rope from, I have no idea, but it's not the slinky. So it looks like they took a rope down. That being said, I would have loved to see Ma Fratelli go down <laughs> a rope into that room because it's not like that they could be helped. Yeah. You have to do that on your own. Yeah. You, what, what do you do? You, like, swing once you so get down there? So this is, I guess, one of those things, again, to where there's only, you know, there's the movies. There's only so much you can explain in the realism part of it. Yeah. But that is how they got down. And for all of these years – we always wondered, how did they get in that room? Yeah, and it's you can barely see it. I mean, it's just for a second that you see the rope. You think that they might have shown that a little bit more so that, you know, years later, adults doing podcasts about the Goonies wouldn't be, you know, trying to analyze this. Well, <laughs> that's such an old movie trope that, you know, just trying to skip past that so you don't think about it. Somebody, it's been pointed out with the old black and white King Kong movie, where you have the one scene where they're on Skull Island, they knock out Kong, and then the next scene, there he is in New York. They're transformed to New York. Well, they don't have a boat big enough to carry a giant monkey. Yeah. <laughs> no, Noah wasn't there. <laughs> got him there somehow. They yeah. got UPS or somebody delivered. <laughs> that'd, be a, that'd be a high uh, fare. Yeah, I think so. Um, another thing is interesting in this chase you know we've talked about throughout this podcast um the darkness that this movie has to where you know we when we started off the movie with someone hanging in a jail cell you know that's the one of the first visuals we get we also have a hand inside of a blender that's almost chopped off there's a lot of things going on that you see a bullet hole to the head of these of the frozen stiff. You know, I was talking before, you know, a lot of times you see dead bodies in movies, but as a child, whenever I saw that bullet hole to the head, that just meant more to me. That made it more real. I don't know, maybe that sounds stupid, but I always made it a little bit more serious when I ever saw the bullet hole yeah. to the head. Well, we hear Francis say, after we dump the kids, how do we get out of here? So in that statement right there, there is no doubt that they intend to kill these kids. Yeah. So all of that rambling on I just did yeah. is to that well, point. Uh, <laughs> did did that affect you guys when you were watching this as kids? I mean, these things like putting a kid's hand in a blender, did that strike y'all as, as something terrible? Or did it just kind of – did you did it almost play for last because it's in yeah, a PG-rated I, movie? And it's, it's just so weird how that happens yeah. in this movie. The fertilities were just cartoonish enough that watching it as a kid – you, I don't think it registered. Right. However, you couldn't make this movie now. Yes. <laughs> but you basically have a bunch of grown-ups chasing and trying to murder children. And then also, you guys have pointed out, uh, you know, how the one guy, uh, Andy's, the guy that Andy was hanging out with. Troy. 
He was sort of a rapey, almost murdery douchebag. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about it. He, when he holds Brand's hand to the car and drives him off a cliff, that's attempted murder. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. It's it's all these things that uh, if you had put if you okay so the everything that happens at the Fratelli's hideout you could put in I always use the the example of the movie Seven and it would work it would make sense but because the Fratelli's are cartoony it is the complete opposite and and we don't even question it so twenty second tangent I'm sorry I have to do this <laughs> go ahead man I went uh, tan, uh, Seven came out in 1995. Or okay. 97, I can't remember. I think it was 95. Okay. And I watched this in the movie theater, and 30 minutes in, there was a bomb threat, and we had what? to leave. And it was on Thanksgiving Day. What? There was a bomb threat, and we had to leave, and then we went back the next day to see it. What theater? Uh, when the, the old Essen Theater. The old Essen Theater, yeah. right by my house. So, anyway, okay, so, whenever yeah. I hear Seven, love the movie, but that's what I think of. That would Sorry. have been terrible. <laughs> uh, dude, Seven Minute. I wonder if anybody's got plans to do that. I will not be me. I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah, you go right ahead, man. Oh, that's that'd be soul crushing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you have I to like watch to that crush every day. Souls, though. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, cinematographer, the the director of photography of the Goonies. That, um, like the composer, uh, I never really knew who it was. And the director of photography's name is Nick McLean, and he's known for his work in both movies and TV. Uh, I'm going to read you off some of the films that he's done here. I guess it's a, a less than stellar collection of titles. Uh, the first is Cannonball Run 2. Ooh, I've seen that, actually. Have you seen the second yeah. one? Yeah. Classic. Classic. Classic movie. Now here's all. <laughs> he did Short Circuit, which I loved oh, yeah. growing up. Johnny, number five. Johnny, five. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he also did Mac and Me. Is anybody in here familiar with Mac and Me? I, I didn't see it. I know what it is. Yeah, Mac and Me was... There, there was just a... Post ET, there were just a lot of little yeah, boy and exactly. his alien movie. Uh, Amy, have you ever seen? Um, have you ever had the uh, privilege of seeing Mac and Me? You know, if I did, I don't really remember. I thought you were about to say, you know what? I wrote it, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> so stop dissing it. I was in it. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, Chris. I you said you haven't seen it. There's a musical I haven't seen number, it, but I know Mac and Me. Yeah, there's a musical number in a McDonald's where all the employees and all the customers they like know this choreographed dance, and Mac is in like a bear costume dancing around on the thing. Well, I would say check it out sometime, but no. Um, so he also uh, did some photography work on Friends and Sybil and Joey. Joey, the spinoff of Friends. Does anybody remember that? No, I don't. <laughs> I bet you my girlfriend does. Did you Did you ever see it, Brad? Yeah, I saw the first one or two episodes, and it was just amazing how you could... Uh, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. That's Yeah. Man, there's some stuff that just... It makes sense that, you know, Friends is such a good show. It makes sense that there there could be a spinoff, and it would work. But yeah, Cheers with Frasier. And you know, Frasier is awesome. But like, uh, let's see, was there a spinoff of Seinfeld? No, no, not that. Well, we had that one. It was close. Well, didn't Elaine have a show? But that was something separate. I know that Kramer had one where he was essentially the same guy. He was a detective or something. Or am I making this up? I don't. I don't know. Right. They would do a lot where they would have. Yeah, Kramer had a. The, the Michael Richards had a show for half a season where it's not a spinoff per se. But it's definitely Michael Richards doing his Kramer stuff, just as a different guy. Exactly. And I think, uh, oh, why can't I think of Elaine's name on Seinfeld? What's her Julie name? Julie Louis-Dreyfus. Yeah. 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 She had a show, and it was like it was like Brad said. I think it, it you watched it knowing that, hey, that used to be Elaine, but it wasn't Elaine in the show. Yeah. New Adventures of Old Christine. Yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. There you go. Well, uh, to get back to the the minute, um, does anybody else have any notes on on this minute? The only other thing I was going to mention was that I love the line when Mama Fratelli says that she can tell they're nearby, she can smell their bubble gum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's one of those lines that's kind of like, follow them size fives. Just these little <laughs> quips that she has about, you know, to... Um, Identify them as children. Out of them five size. Five size. size. Five. <laughs> I can't even say it. There you go. Well, it was great because she's she's she is cartoonist, but she seems like she's almost part animal the way she's like she's yes. sniffing them out, and as Chris mentioned, like she starts snorting in the next yes. minute or two. It, she's she is threatening. 
yeah, yeah, she really is. I mean, she's just got this like kind of, I don't know. Well, there's three separate occa- there's three separate occasions, I and mean, we'll talk about it next minute. Three separate occasions next minute where they cut to her leading the, her sons, and she's got that grunt going. Yeah, on. three separate occasions. It is very, yeah, primal, a- animalistic or something. I don't know. Yeah, oh. Brad, that's a good observation. The the only other thing that I have about the minute is right at the end. You see Bran, and then Andy's kind of looking at him really closely, and I think he's she's trying to see if he's got the braces, because remember Mikey has braces and Bran doesn't, and he, and Andy wasn't aware of that, so she's looking at him real close, and then she kind of makes a note to uh she makes like kind of a notion because she wants to go kiss him again, and that's when. You hear the you hear the Fratellis show up. It's yeah. man, it's it's amazing how quickly they got mm-hmm. they they made up the ground. But then again, you're thinking they're in a hurry, right, to get them. Where the Goonies, and they, they haven't been there. They haven't been there yet. They're kind of feeling their way around. If you think about it too, the Goonies have left them a rope. They've taken care of all yeah. the booby traps, so they don't have to be slowed down by those. Right. Um, there are those giant boulders. The giant boulders they had to climb over somehow, but um. But, but yeah, that's it. That's all I got. That's all I got for this minute. You guys have anything else? No, I'm good. I'm good. All righty. Well, I tell you what, we're going to go ahead and wrap up minute number 75. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We will be back here uh, tomorrow for minute number 76. And until then, this is Brady. And this is Chris. And we're here. <laughs> Brad and Amy are also here to remind you that Goonies never, never say, say die. die. Goonies Minute is a fan-supported podcast. If you like the show, then leave us a review on iTunes. You can find us at GooniesMinute.com, Facebook.com slash GooniesMinute, Twitter.com slash GooniesMinute, and at Instagram at GooniesMinute. You can contact us at GooniesMinute at gmail.com. You've been listening to a Pele Media Podcast. For premium content and exclusive podcasts, visit us at Patreon.com slash Media. Check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash Media. Yeah.